So this is a technical presentation for the ICR classifier. Um, I will start with a, a brief overview of the problem of classification and prediction with HTM and talk about the classifier, which is a feedforward classification network, and how I uh, optimize the weights in the um, network using an online learning algorithm. Uh, there will be some algorithmic description of the classifier and some comparisons uh, with the old CRA classifier at the end of the presentation. So for typical uh, use of HTM, they have some streaming data fitting in through an encoder that um, data into the part of this particular presentation. Uh, the HTM um, model can, uh, can learn sequences from the data stream, and we can do a bunch of useful things such as anomaly detection, prediction, or classification. So in this talk, I will focus on this part, the classifier part, uh, and how we use the uh, high dimensional uh, sparse distributed representation in HTM uh, to do prediction and classification tasks. So currently, there are three classifier under new peak algorithms. Um, the first one is the cleanest neighbor classifier, which is typically used for uh, categorical classification. It maintains a set of template SDRs in memory. Um, but it does not evaluate the full, uh, the full predict predictive distribution. It just gives you the best match uh, using KN. It's very simple, uh, but may not work very well for online prediction tasks. Uh, the CRA classifier is the one we have been using. Our pad for predictive value. Uh, it does give you a full. This is the motivation of developing the SDR classifier. The goal is uh, to improve the prediction accuracy uh, compared to the CRA classifier. And here I'm using a simple feedforward classification network that's optimized by using maximum likelihood estimation. I will explain those terms. UA on the CLA classifier, you, you say it's a heuristic voting algorithm. Is that something that's known? I mean, is that a term that means something? Or is, it just a, is that just a description of some algorithm we made up? Uh, yeah, it's just that. So the description. I can't say what that is. It's just by reading this. It's, it's, um, yeah. Some homegrown thing. Yeah. Right. It's developed by Numenta, and basically each bit in the SDR uh, votes for some uh, prediction value, and you combine the voting. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's simple enough that saying voting scheme or whatever, somebody could reasonably. Yes, what that is. Yeah. Which there is already documentation and video explaining what that is. Yeah. Already so. Yeah. Uh, so I will focus on the SDR classifier in this talk. Uh, it, it's meant to be a replacement for the CRA classifier. Uh, that gives you a full distribution and works for works for both prediction and classification problems. <coughs> so here is the setup for the SDR classification problem. And the goal is to map a sequence of high-dimensional SDRs, um, labeled as X here, T is time, uh, to a distribution over a set of K classes. So this is the output of the classifier, which is also changing over time. And since it's a predictive distribution, it should sum to one at any uh, time point. And the goal is uh, to, uh, to have high prediction probability for the true class label, which is Z here. Z is the training uh, data. Like for typical prediction, that's maybe five steps ahead in time. That's our true data. I'm confused. I'm sorry to ask the question, but maybe other people are confused too. Um, the CLA classifier takes the current state of the HTM temporal memory, yeah. and that's it. It just takes that state, which the state itself incorporates time in the past. Um, yeah. In this case, you're saying you're trying to map a sequence of n-dimensional. Oh, I'm also taking one against one data sample at a time. All right. Taking the current. All right. So data this is not, you're not actually classifying the sequence. You're really going to classify the SDR. The SDR, the single SDR. Single SDR. That not the sequence. It's not a. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's yeah. the same idea. You're just take whatever the current state is, and yet you're saying that state was derived from a series like this. Yeah. Right. So maybe it's. Uh, Clear if I show this with. So this is the current state of the HDN. Imagine this is a high-dimensional SDR. I only show a few bits here. So I want to uh, map it to a set of classes. Let's say I have three classes, and I want to know what is the probability that the current input lies in that class. Mm -hmm. So here is a uh, probability distribution that sums to one. Um, 
and I want to uh, I want the target to have high prediction probability. So I have basically so the input is the current state. This is the output of my classifier, and I come I try to optimize it such that it matches the target. So a feedforward classification network is just like that. So um, it's a linear. So each unit here uh, first take a linear summation, a weighted summation of all the inputs. So the weight matrix W is the only parameter, I mean, the set of parameters in the model. Uh, and because it's a, pre, a, a, a distribution here, uh, the nonlinearity, there is an additional nonlinearity called the soft max to make sure that the uh, prediction probability stems to one. So it basically takes the exponential of each input uh, and then divided by all the other inputs. So it's a normalization step here. So uh, this is the only difference from typical uh, perceptron or uh, artificial neural network. But the softmax is a well-known thing. It, that, it is a very well-known thing. And, neural networks. Yeah. And the question is, how should we um, learn those connection weights such that uh, the prediction probability matches the data? So uh, we use the maximum likelihood estimation. Likelihood is basically a metric of how well you are modeling the, the data. So here we are trying to predict the data, uh, they here, the true label. Um, and likelihood is simply the probability of observing the, the data under the predicted distribution. So here is my model uh, predicted distribution. I want to uh, make sure that the, the true data is more likely um, to, to occur according to my model. And typically, people use independent assumptions, basically saying that each uh, input, each SDR uh, input output pair is independent with each other, such that you can um, uh, simplify this to a summation of, of, to the product uh, across time steps. Are you saying independent in time or independent? Independent across time, which may not be true, but it's necessary for the duration of the algorithm. And the maximum likelihood estimation principle is simply to select the parameter W that maximize the likelihood here. So how do we do that? In machine learning, typically people define a loss function uh, that is easy to, op uh, to optimize. So instead of uh, the original uh, likelihood, uh, typically people use what's known as a negative log likelihood. It's simply the log logarithm of this uh, and inverted by the sign. So uh, because logarithm is a monotonic function, maximizing likelihood is equivalent at minimizing the neg log likelihood function in this case. And um, the way we do that is to uh, uh, do gradient descent using this loss function. Basically, you calculate the gradient of the loss function with respect to uh, all the parameters in the model. That's the connection weight matrix. Um, so the full derivation is available uh, in this document. Um, but the, after the derivation, the learning rule is very simple. It's basically uh, the difference between your know, model actual output and the target output times the input. So uh, this is uh, if, uh, the connection weight from the IC input to the J's class. Uh, you adjust it by uh, in proportional to this, uh, uh, this gradient. Um, it's uh, somewhat intuitive to see how, how this is derived. Basically, this part, this is using the chain rule. Um, <coughs> this is just a linear, so uh, this is a, a, the equations describing the fit forward net, uh, network. Um, this part gives you the, the input. If you derive, uh, calculate the derivative of this with respect to W, you get XI, and you calculate the derivative with respect to uh, the AJ here, you get this part. In, in our case, xi will be the zero one. Yeah, if uh, they have a binary sparse uh, vector as the input, and the, the target output is also uh, zero one. At any time point, you only have one target output. You only know the true class label. So this is the algorithmic description of the SDR classifier. There are basically three phases: first, the initialization, and inference, and learning. Initialization is uh, simply to initialize the connection weight matrix WIJ to be zeros um, everywhere. 
that implies that all classes occur with equal probability before learning. Um, this is uh, uh, obvious if you look at uh, the activation function in the, class, uh, in the classification network. Uh, basically, AKs are all zeros before learning, and you have the same probability for all classes. And inference is uh, to calculate the uh, model predicted class probability for each input pattern xi here, um, again using the, the same equation. Uh, and learning involves adjust the connection weight, WIG, uh, uh, in proportional to the uh, gradient. Since we consider a binary input here, so xi are either 0 or 1, so basically we will adjust the weight if the, for, only for the active inputs. So we don't need to adjust the, um, all the weight connections. So only at any time, only a very small fraction of the weight matrix is updated because the input is very sparse. Um, and additionally, additionally, for scalar value prediction, we keep a running <coughs> average of actual values that correspond to each class. This is the same as the old CRA classifier, just to make uh, the prediction a little bit more accurate. And the time complexity of this algorithm is proportional to the number of active bits at any time point times the number of classes. So this is very uh, easy to see because here that uh, the summation here involves. Um, what is time complexity? It's how, how, how long, how, how does the algorithm scale uh, with respect to the number of inputs, with respect to, to the number of. Does, does the speed of the How speed of the operation is yeah. so much? Yeah. UA, real quick. Uh -huh. uh, we have the scalar prediction line. Yeah. Do you keep a separate, like a, a lookup table somewhere uh, apart from the network where you're storing those values? Yes. Okay. So there is a value corresponding to each bucket, uh, each class, mm -hmm. and you keep a rolling average to uh, keep track of the actual values. So basically, the buckets in the scalar encoder become right. classes, are the same as classes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we want to do that. Similar to the CLA classifier. Yeah. So compared to the CRA classifier, this is more expensive because also <coughs> the, the theory classifier time complexity is only the S times N, that's the number of active bits. Uh, here we need to additionally uh, time the number of classes because we want to evaluate, evaluate the full uh, distribution at any time point. So there are a few properties of the SDR classifier derived from HTM. The first HTM is a continuous learning algorithm. So here the parameter W has to adapt in an online fashion. Um, so we are not using group, uh, batch training for the classifier. Uh, and second, HTM uses SDR. Uh, this is uh, very important, and uh, that because of that, we only need to update a very small fraction of the weight. And also a, a side benefit is uh, because a lot of the weights are not tuned at any time, practically it seems to be less prone to overfitting compared to networks that use dense input vectors. That's just an observation you had? It's ob there are some papers uh, saying how sparse coding has to oh, is over overfitting. So in deep learning models, uh, if you have some of the hidden layers as uh, sparse, mm -hmm. yeah. that can help prevent overfitting uh, for the exact same reason. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of intuitive. I just didn't know if that's something you observed it was previously known. Uh, it's what we observed, and I think it's also known. Um, and finally, because HTM supports simultaneous representation of multiple predictions, um, the SDR classifier also evaluates the full predict distribution. So, and it reinforces correct predictions and also penalizes incorrect predictions. So the second part is not uh, in the CRA classifier, and that's the reason why CRA, CRA, the old CRA classifier, occasionally gives you outliers. Because only in CRA classifiers, according to the voting scheme, only the correct predictions are involved, reinforced, not the incorrect ones. And here is a simple experiment of classifying random SDR. So here I have a small set of 20 labeled SDR. The task is to Given that CR is the label in a streaming scenario, it's like a unit test for the algorithm, and we compare with uh, the previous CRA classifier on this task. So here I'm showing the um, negative. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand the setup here because you say you have 20 labeled SDRs. Yeah. 
uh, but you're doing it in a streaming scenario. I mean, you're labeling the the state of the HTM at any point in time. Yeah. Yeah. Or are you are you streaming in a sequence and then classifying it? You're classifying in each step? I'm we classify at each step. It's a continuous learning. So at each time step, I randomly select one SDR and fit it to the network. What does the data look like? It's just a, the input is a stream of random SDRs. So this is just like a unit test for the algorithm. So assume there's some SDR coming in. Yeah. It could be from an HTM or Is there any HTML. sequence of these SDRs? Uh, in this case, no sequence structure. It's just a so then by calling it a streaming scenario, then that's uh, I'm confused. It's uh, streaming means I'm monitoring the performance online. Yeah. Okay. It's not really the data itself is not temporal data at this point. No. It's just no. random SDRs. And, yeah. And you're just updating every every data point. Correct. That's so, what you mean. Yeah. So if I could have said this, uh, predict the label in an online learning fashion. Yeah, online learning. That would have been the same thing. Yes. And clearer for me. Okay. Yes. It's, uh, it's the same. Um, and, and does every SDR only have one label here or multiple labels? One label. Okay. Why do you want multiple well, labels? Predicting multiple predictions. Yeah, because where the whole setup here is to predict the distribution. Yeah, right. it's possible to do that, but in this case, it's just one label. So this is the performance um, over, over, over time in an online learning fashion. So for both SDR and CRA classifier, the uh, likelihood improves over as you as the network as the classifier. So you're just going through the 20 labeled ones in order. It'll one, two, one, randomly. One, one, oh, randomly. Randomly. It doesn't really matter. Really. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. So just randomly. Yeah. So by the time I get to 200, it's a good chance that everyone's been seen about 10 times. So. Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, here I'm showing at the end of learning. What is the model uh, output? If uh, in this case the, the true label is uh, number ten, so for the SDR classifier, it's almost uh, uh, predicting perfectly, saying, "Okay, I'm very sure this is class number ten." But for the theory classifier, you can see because of the incorrect incorrect predictions are not finalized, it's also predicting other classes with a small probability. So uh, this is a case without noise. So you may say it doesn't matter because you can also. Do you think that this is more due to your new learning rule or the having soft, the softmax? Due to the learning rule. Okay. Due to the, because. Do you think adding the softmax to the CLA classifier wouldn't help? Uh, CLA classifier also have its own normalization scheme. I don't think that's uh, much different from softmax. So this result is sort of a given. Should be, you know, it's almost like the CLA, just showing the weakness of the CLA classifier as opposed to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could you could get this perfect performance of a K and N, right? I mean, just 20 things, you just perfectly yeah. match it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, if you look at prediction accuracy if, uh, instead of likelihood, in this case, there will be no difference because uh, it's very easy task. Both classifiers can learn. Um, but if you have noise, in, in the second experiment, um, the task is given corrupted, noise corrupted SDRs predict the label. So it's a little bit more challenging. Um, so here is the performance. So I'm showing the uh, stable after it learns the, um, the, the sequences, the other SDRs. Uh, so you're not training on noisy data, you're training on Clean data, clean data and test down not tested it. Yeah. You could have trained it. Yeah, I could do it the other way. I, that would I would be interesting, it. actually. After you show this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I could do that. Yeah. So this is train on clean data, test with noisy data. Uh, so here I'm showing performance as a function of noisy level, noise level. So uh, the SDRs are 40 out of uh, 2,000 uh, typical SDRs. So noise level 40 will be. Uh, completely random, but as you can see, that it's uh, that the new SDR classifier is still perfect after 35 of the bits have been. Uh, hey, let me just uh, challenge something you just said there. I mean, 40 out of 2,000 is our typical uh, columnar activation or the output of the SP. But in this, most of the times when we're classifying this, we're classifying temporal memory. the temporal memory state, which would be maybe 40 out of 20,000, something like that. So it'd be much yeah. sparser. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how that would have impact things, but just to just be clear. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Here I'm just focusing on the difference between the new and the old yeah. classifier. I don't think it would make any difference. I don't think so. I just want to be clear that 
if someone were listening to this that what are we classifying? We're not classifying the output of the SP, we're classifying the, the state of temple memory. And it's fine to use 40 out of 2,000, it's just as long as you understand what yeah. that means. Yeah. And because of the, the basic properties of SDRs, you do expect that you can still classify it even though a significant fraction of the bits are uh, corrupted. Well, Something. yeah, in, in this case, you only have 20 SDRs. Yeah. So it's not using up all 2,048 bits. Yeah. So just knowing what a couple of bits are should be enough. Yes. yes. That's why. Uh, but you have multi labels, you have. No, there's no multi labels. Yeah. But you have the different. Yeah. yeah. It's also like a unit test, it's not a real world. Yeah. Um, There's a few um, questions. 20 is the number of classes here? 20 yes. is the number of SDRs. 20 is the number of classes. Oh, it's both. It's both. So yeah. we have 20 distinct SDRs belonging to the state classes. Yeah. yeah. And this uh, error, or the one that here is shown, is like average overall 20 or like how? Uh, or you're like sequential training for one accurate. You can think of it as average over all 20. So basically, I'm, so I'm sorting the uh, the stable performance. So this is a, a rolling average, so over the last <coughs> year. It's similar to average across all, all the data sets. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically I think that the new SDR classifier preserves the uh, robust noise robustness of the SDR, whereas the, the old theory classifier is uh, gradually, uh, the performance gradually decreases uh, as a function of noise. So this, this plot is showing that the effect shown on the right plot on the previous slide is getting worse as you have noise. As you have noise. So this will be the effect showing as the previous slide here. If you increase noise, the difference gets larger. Uh, and the third experiment is a continuous learning. So I train it um, after it gets stable performance and then I switch to a different data set and see how fast the classifier adapts to the new, new data set. Uh, so the SDR classifier it takes about the same amount of time for it to get perfect performance. Whereas for the theory classifier, somehow it never rec recovers to the previous baseline. I think it's still because of a lot of the false predictions are still there. It's not penalized. So you you learn the new new ones, but the old ones are still there. So basically your um, your pr uh, distribution gets uh, less precise. So you were. Mm -hmm. Uh, you initialize the network with just zero weights. Yeah. So would you would you think when you have this interruption here mm -hmm. that because of the penalization that it'll basically reinitialize? It depends on whether it's sharing the same weights, whether it's conflicting data set. If I um, well, I'm assuming here that the data sets aren't. Right. It's just a, another set of random SDRs. Some of the bits uh, are conflicting, some of them are sure. not much. On average, it'd be on average, average maybe it's small. It's very, very over little. Yeah. Time. And the others should then go to zero, basically. Yeah. The other way. Yeah. So I can imagine if I switch back to the original data set after this, it still gets pretty good uh, likelihood because uh, it's using different set of connection weights. You have one set of SDRs and a second set of SDRs. They are not much confliction between oh, the yeah. oh, oh, I see. Yeah. Um, so we also use the SDR classifier for the taxi passenger count prediction, and this is in the neural computation paper. Um, and again, the task is to predict future taxi demand. So here I'm using encoder, uh, sequence memory, and SDR classifier network. So it's classify, actually classifying the states of the HTM. Um, so as you can see on the left is the theory classifier. So if you use the traditional root mean square error metric, it's 0.5. You write for the SDR classifier, it's 0.3. Uh, it's much better than the, <coughs> even if you use, use the traditional metric, not using likelihood. Uh, also, the prediction looks much cleaner. A lot of the uh, so as you can see here, there are a lot of false predictions. Occasionally, you even get a, a dramatic outlier here, which has a very big impact on. You might want to explain what those red things are. Okay, so so the black is the data. It's the black is the true data we want to predict. The blue is the uh, the best prediction according to the classifier, and the red is the underlying distribution. 
predictive distribution of the data according to the classifier. So, so uh, again, this is predicting how far in advance? Five steps ahead. Uh, which is how much in the uh, two and Two and a half hour ahead of time. I'm just saying I can't. I, I, okay. I, I shifted the prediction uh, to align with the data. These are daily. Uh, these are daily, right? Yeah, each in every half an hour. We uh, get it. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I'm showing. So this will be one day, 24 hours, 48 data points. You can see, like on the left, like around 17050. There's a lot of false. Yeah. The blue shows a lot of yeah. false yeah. predictions. Yeah. And here is also. We still have one here. On yes, the side. it's not perfect with real data. It's always. Um, it's uh, better. But uh, I don't expect any classifier to be perfect with real data. Well, that one jumps out as again as an outlier. Uh, it is an outlier in this case. Which I would have been nice if all the outliers disappeared. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean there are still things we could do to improve it. Like the uh, in the current implementation, we have a single learning rate. Uh, so there is a, one critical parameter which is alpha. It's how fast you adjust the weight. Mm -hmm. um, right now we just set it to be. A small number, and maybe you could do smarter things like uh, you adaptively adjust the weight uh, if you like using a momentum term yeah. or other machine learning yeah. techniques that could possibly further improve the performance. Mm -hmm. You can also tune in with the anomaly scores coming out of the PM. Is that Yeah, so. Uh, when going along an data stream, it would be typical to just gradually decrease the learning rate. Yeah. Uh, that's assuming that the statistics of the data stream are remaining relatively constant. Yeah. Uh, but if we, if a TM detects some sort of anomalous behavior, mm -hmm. that means that yeah. uh, statistics are changing. Yeah. Such that you could possibly, uh, well, depending on some other parameters, uh, decrease the learning rate after seeing some anomalous data. Yeah. Um, that could yeah. So the equilibrium is right. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. There is room there for further there improvement. There are. So here we are. Right now we are using very simple uh, learning algorithm here. And even with that, it's quite a bit better. Yeah. 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 Right. So I think that's all I have. So it just. Uh, Checked in to NewPick. What's the status of this? It's in NewPick. Uh, Are we going to remove the CLA classifier or just stay there? Uh, we should at least deprecate it. Yeah, I'd like to switch to this one as the default for everything. I think CLA classifier is not used anywhere anymore. Good. That's so it should be. Yeah. yeah. I think it's it's sort of ironic that we applying sort of a classic neural network on top of the, <laughs> you know, the biological, biological, neural, biological neural network. Um, yeah. Yeah. Amusing, it doesn't mean anything more than that. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, we, could, we do that with KNN as well, and, you know, classic. No, I know, I know. It's, it's just funny, that's all. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it doesn't mean anything beyond that. Yeah. It's not called neural network. Yeah, that's, that's really why we, we name it as a C SDR classifier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very explicit decision. <laughs> well, there are some things you are slightly different because of the sparsity of the um, yeah of the, the patterns you're classifying. Um, I'm just curious, how would it react? You know, in typical HTM sequence memory, you often have multi union of states at once. Uh, and so, if you try to classify that, what do you get? What, how does this behave in that situation? If you, like, if I have two SDRs presented simultaneously. Well, yeah. So let's say I'm, I'm trying to classify two sequences, and I run those sequences to the end, and then I get a, a state, and I classify, and I run. Sequ I mean, well, it's somewhere along the way, it, 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 well, those sequences are the same. Mm -hmm. I guess they have the same label. So at that point, you have. Uh, so well, there's two ways. Two things. One is an F, a state could be labeled in two, and a very sparse state could be labeled in two different classes. Mm -hmm. That's one issue. Yeah. And the other issue is you can have a union of states. Yeah. Um, if you have a union of states, you could get multiple predictions uh, in the. Well, not, it would be. Would you? That'd be nice. I mean, it would be nice. You could say, well, it's a union. I get the union of 
Yeah, we ha I think we have unit tests for that to make sure that in those scenarios you get yeah. multiple predictions. So basically, the the prediction uh, will have two peaks. So, and, and from a practical point of view, um, the, the other scenario where I have, let's say, two sequences that are the same for a while, then they differentiate, right? Um, I don't know what that even means in this case. So would I classify at every point along the sequence and then I'd be classifying the same state in two different ways? I think it depends how far ahead you're, predict you're classifying. So in our thing, you can say how many steps ahead you're well, predicting. That's for prediction, but just yeah. pure classification. It's the same here. Uh, so when we say we're predicting, you're really classifying the next state into mm -hmm. these buckets. And so if it's the next state, it would say the same, the same, the same uh, until it defers. Yeah. If you're doing multiple steps into the future, it will immediately give you a probability yeah. distribution. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Nice. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Nice work. Is Nab um